This is Duke University. And so generally, we think of microbes as these fuzzy, slimy, gross things. Generally, microbes are not necessarily hailed as polar bears are, or penguins, or even, you know, gerbils. Um, we think of microbes as low life that causes a lot of problems, um, including rot our food, grow in our houses, and destroy our homes. This is not, you know, microbes doing things for us. Um, destroying our crops. Um, lots of microbes are out there that we're fighting uh, to keep our crops free of pathogens. Um, and get ready for it. Uh, microbes sometimes can cause harm to us, um, living on our bodies and destroying our own health. Um, but, you know, collectively that causes all these headlines to frighten us all the time about the, you know, the deadly microbes that are out there that are making us sick. But I would argue that most microbes, most of the microbial diversity in the world that we live in, is totally fine. In fact, many of them help us and do wonderful things. Um, and so today, um, I'm going to talk about microbes and cheese, but I just wanted to put this in a broader context, that everywhere on our planet, everywhere that we go, um, from the soil right out there in the yard, um, in the quad, to deep in the oceans, to even the microbial landscapes on our own bodies, there are thousands and millions of species of microbes doing really important things for us, and that we don't really appreciate, because uh, we have this very negative view of the microbial world. Um, today, I'll be sort of talking very briefly about uh, one element of microbes doing wonderful things for us, beautiful, delicious things for us, and that is cheese. Um, and I like to say that in cheese, we essentially have delicious rot. Uh, we have microbes that are growing for their own good, really, to rot the food. They're trying to decompose the cheese, break it down. Um, but the byproduct of that are these beautiful, delicious things that we call artisan cheese. So each of these pictures here uh, shows you a different uh, type of cheese, and all of these different colors, all these different textures, all those things that you see, and of course the flavors that you'll taste tonight are from the microbes. So when I think of a cheese shop, when I walk in a cheese shop, I really think of a galaxy. Because um, as you zoom in, as you move in on each of those pieces of cheese, it's like a planet. Um, it's like a little microbial planet that's living on that cheese. Um, and as you zoom in even further, if you kind of, you know, took one of those cheeses and put it up to your face, you can see, um, you know, in this particular example, there's some fuzz. That's probably a mold of some sort. Um, but it'd be kind of like, you know, flying over Durham, where you can see there's some highways, there's probably a university here somewhere. I don't really know Durham very well, but this would be the perspective that you would get. You know, this is the general perspective we have, where we just see that there's something there, there seems to be major structures, but we don't understand the people, the types of students, the, the faculty. Um, so what we do in the lab is we take that next step. We zoom in even further and understand the microbes that make up artisan cheese. So this is an example of if we took a cheese, this is Bailey Hayes and Blue, our, our lab rat, something I know Heather is very familiar with as well, uh, made in northern Vermont. And if you just take that cheese and plate it out in the lab on a petri dish, a, a perfect place for microbes to grow, where most scientists, most microbiologists grow microbes, this is what you get from that brine, from that surface. This beautiful mix of bacteria and fungi that are growing on the surface of that cheese. It's beautiful. I think it's gorgeous. Um, and these are some shots from the lab. We love taking pretty pictures of microbes. Some of them are on the wall over here. Um, it's just a beautiful world that is right in front of your face, uh, making these beautiful uh, cheeses. So many different colors, shapes, and sizes of all these beautiful microbes. It's like you're flying out into space. So who are these microbes? What, what are these good microbes in, that are on these cheeses? Um, well, there's three groups of microbes um, that we generally talk about. Uh, we talk about mold. So many people have probably grown mold in, in, inadvertently in your refrigerator on those strawberries that you let go too long, or that bread. Um, that fuzzy fungus, that's mold. And molds are really important in a lot of cheeses, and we'll talk about that tonight. Um, the other group of uh, organisms to know about are yeast. Um, and so generally we think of yeast um, as being important in wine, um, producing alcohol. But there are a lot of yeasts that play really important roles in the development of the aesthetics of cheeses. And then the final group of microbes are bacteria. So how many people ate yogurt today? Yeah, great. You ate billions of microbial <laughs> cells, you ate billions of bacteria. Um, bacteria are also really important um, in making cheese. And these are the three main groups that, that we talk about when we're, we're understanding the microbial diversity of the subnature on cheese. 
Um, and we're going to hear more, I'm sure, from Portia um, about how cheesemakers direct these microbial communities. How do they manage this microscopic world growing on these cheeses? Um, and in general, for an artisan cheese that has a microbial rind, there are three main things that cheesemakers do to help manage these micro communities. Um, the first is um, a, making a bloomy rind cheese. So far over there um, is a classic camembert style cheese. We call them bloomy rind cheeses because the cheesemakers inoculate these cheeses with a mold. They add a mold to the milk as they're making it. And during the aging process, it literally blooms with the white mold on the surface. It's really beautiful to see this poofy cloud of, of mold, which gets me really excited. Um, and that is a bloomy rind cheese. And these are, this is a very controlled inoculation. These are molds that we've studied for many, many years. The French have been working with these for many, many years. And that's one approach to making cheese, to sort of condition it to ripen in a certain way. Another approach, which people claim was invented by really bored monks who had a lot of time on their hands, um, is making a washed rind cheese, where during the aging, after you've made the curds and you've formed your cheese into the shape, you continuously wash the surface of the cheese over and over and over again. And these tend to be those really stinky sort of foot cheeses that have really pungent odors to them, like Gates' mom really likes. Um, those are washed rind cheeses, and the washing selects for certain microbes to grow on that surface. So those orange colors, that's usually not a pigment added. That's actually microbes growing on the surface of that cheese. An example of that would be like a Taleggio, um, is a class of washed rind cheese. Um, and finally, we have natural rind cheeses. So these are your tome de savoies, your cloth bound cheddars of the world, where um, they make the cheese, um, they form it into a shape, and do very little. And in, in the case of these cheeses, you're often uh, growing the microbes on the surface as a protective uh, sort of coating on the outside. Um, so historically, we didn't have plastic or wax. You know, we didn't have uh, plastic wrapped you know, craft cheddar. Uh, we had microbes, uh, and we grew them on the surface of these cheeses to protect the inside. Um, so this becomes a natural sealant. Um, and this is what a typical cheese cake would look like where you're growing these microbes, and you have a, a succession, a progression of the cheese aging. So over here we have a washed rind cheese. This is uh, what I like to call naked cheese. There's no rind, it's freshly made. Um, and it goes to the aging. You can see that as you go uh, back in time, these are really mature cheeses that have a rind developed on them. And the same thing is true over here for this cheese. This is a really young cheese, and as we get older and older, they get fuzzier and I think much more interesting. Um, so what do these rinds do? What are, what are the functions of growing these microbes? Um, so this is perhaps my favorite mold. I develop fungal crushes. I, I have crushes on certain microbes. This is my current crush. Um, it's this mold of Sporodonema casei. Bright orange, right? That should be frightening. You shouldn't eat that. That's toxic. That's bad for you. Um, in this case, it's actually adding a lot of value to this cheese, Hudson Flower, uh, which is being sold at Murray's in New York City. Um, this is a mold that is intentionally grown um, it's perfectly safe, it's not toxic in any way. In fact, it's adapted to growing in the dairy environment, and the French have been working it, with it for many years. And it adds um, a beautiful color, a beautiful uh, look to these cheeses, but also an amazing flavor. Um, so you can go to, to eat the East Village and buy the Hudson flower with this particular mold on it. And another really beautiful texture you'll see, if you ever walk into a shop and see these really brainy, sort of corally looking uh, cheeses, that's again because of microbial growth. That's not because they've actually pressed the cheese in a way. That's microbes creating this undulating structure on the surface. Another one of my favorites, um, Geotricum candidum. It's a, it's a mold yeast hybrid. Beautiful. Um, but sometimes, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, um, as with many things in life. Um, this is an interesting uh, organism, a pink yeast which when it grows on a wasp rind cheese like that cheese over there, that's actually what the cheesemaker wanted. They wanted that cheese to have that pink surface on the wasp rind. But it can contaminate some cheese, contaminate, um, and grow where it wasn't supposed to be, and that becomes undesirable. And this is true with uh, many of the microbes that people grow in these cheeses. As they're trying to manage it, just like some people think some flowers are beautiful, some flowers are weeds, we have the same issue coming up in the context of growing these microbes on cheese. Um, and then, there's a video, Tom, if you could just move the cursor right around here and push play and gross people out. Um, another uh, component 
um, to the rinds of many cheeses, which was recently in the news, a big controversy, are these adorable little cheese mites. Um, aren't they cute or gross for some people? Um, I think they're adorable, but they're a natural part of the aging of some really old um, natural rind cheeses. And what you're seeing here, these tubes growing across the surface, that's mold that I've grown in the lab. And I've added this cheese mite, um, and these cheese mites run around like little gophers on the surface of the cheese, eating the mold. They're not eating the cheese, they're actually eating the mold. Um, and they're another part of this micro community. They're there grazing across the surface, a natural part of the community. Natural, maybe not to the FDA standards, but um, to some people's view, uh, the French uh, mimolette makers, it's definitely natural. Isn't that cute? I can watch this for hours. Um, so mimolette is a cheese that is traditionally aged with these mites crawling all over the surface. Um, the idea is that they aerate the surface and, and add uh, aesthetics. Um, so in the, I talked about this earlier, uh, controlled rot. So we get beautiful cheeses, but the microbes are also releasing flavors. And we'll probably hear more from Portia about how we can control that. But from the microbiological perspective, it's much like a rotting log in the forest. When you see those mushrooms popping up out of the log, you can think about the same thing when you see a rind growing out of cheese. Um, these microbes are growing on the surface and they produce enzymes, chemical scissors, that slowly decompose that solid milk and break it down and produce those amazing flavors that we perceive. Um, so this spaghetti network on the surface is really just microbes rotting the cheese. Um, and there's lots of flavors. Um, we can get everything from stinky socks, to buttery flavors, to cabbage. My favorite description is a sweet buttery flatulence. I think it's a very common um, way to describe many of the cheese flavors that are out there. You know, the science of the, the microbiology of these cheeses, um, who is actually out there? What is the diversity of the microbes? And that's what we've been doing in the lab. We're really interested in understanding microbial diversity, this subnature that's on these cheeses, and what um, creates that diversity um, as a, a model system for us to understand microbes. And so one of the big projects we've been doing is um, going around the world, collecting cheese rinds, eating a lot of cheese. Uh, we essentially scrape the surface and eat the paste. That's our job. Uh, it's amazing. Um, and studying the microbial diversity that we find in those rinds. So one of our first projects was to sample 137 different cheeses from around the world, mostly North America and Europe, um, and look at the diversity of microbes that are there. And I won't go into great detail, there's a lot of technical information, but I'll just show you some of the information we can gather from this. So this is what we found. This is our rainbow of cheese microbes. And again, I won't get into the details. Uh, I'll tell you where you can go later if you want to find out more. But we see a lot of variation. There's a lot of incredible diversity out there. Um, this is data for bacteria. This is data for fungi. Um, and all the different colors represent different types of bacteria and fungi. Um, and the different columns are different cheeses. So as you look across cheeses, you see very different patterns in this microbial diversity that's out there. Um, one thing that was really interesting um, for us in sort of changing our view of the microbial diversity on cheese is we're finding a lot of marine bacteria. So bacteria that you only find growing out in the ocean, growing on these cheeses. Cheese is made in Wisconsin, very far from the ocean. Um, and we think that what's actually happening is the sea salt that cheesemakers are using are bringing in uh, microbes from the ocean and they're growing on these cheeses, which has completely changed our view of how cheese is made in, in age. Um, so if you want more details on our, our science sort of to geek out a lot more, I've created this website called microbialfoods.org where I digest the science of cheese and a bunch of other fermented foods. So I would highly recommend uh, checking that out to understand more about um, this particular work. There's a lot of really cool stuff that we found out from these cheese rinds that we sampled. The other thing that we're trying to do in the lab is mimic what happens out in these cheese caves around the world and recreate it in an in vitro cheese. Um, so actually doing just like what people do with fruit flies and with mice um, and with all these model organisms, but we do it with cheese. We make tiny little cheeses. So this plate right here is about that big. So those are 96 tiny little cheeses. Um, and we're learning all kinds of really interesting things about how microbes work. This really interesting food is teaching us about the natural world around us. So this is uh, just, it's so beautiful and fun to do. Uh, this is a, an experiment where we cross different bacteria and fungi 
and we're trying to look at war and peace. You know, do these microbes help each other out when they're growing together, or are they fighting with each other? And um, this is what some of the experiments will look like in the lab. And we're actually finding both. They're actually fighting each other. So this is an example of one microbe killing another microbe. Um, and this is an example of a microbe promoting the growth of another microbe. Um, so we're finding that they're both helping and hurting each other. And this is all happening, you know, as you put that piece of cannon bear in your mouth, there's a whole world of interactions happening there. It's really cool, but how is that helping people like Portia or other people out there trying to make cheese? And that's one thing that we're really focused on is taking our science out to the world of the practitioners. Um, and we're doing a lot of, you know, just like people manage ecosystems, where they manage forests or manage prairies, um, we're dealing with problems that come up when we make cheese. Um, it doesn't always go like you want it to. It doesn't always go as planned. Um, and so, you know, this cheese isn't, isn't supposed to be black. Um, and that cheese, it lost its rind. For some reason, the rind isn't growing. Um, and this is where a mold has gotten a little over, over uh, overzealous and started to break into the curd. Um, you know, one of the biggest problems is keeping blue molds off of cheese. Um, people don't like their cheese when it has a blue spot on it. So we deal a lot with invasive species. Um, this is, these blue molds are invasive species for us. Um, and the other thing that we're really excited about today is understanding how to go out into the world of the microbes that we have and develop new cultures that cheesemakers can use. Um, so one sort of secret about the cheesemaking world is a lot of the cultures that are used in the US to make cheese are actually from France. They're not, uh, you know, they're not really capturing necessarily the terroir of a particular place because we have to buy them from French producers. Um, so we've been working with cheesemakers to find microbes in their raw milk um, and help them develop those to use them as cultures for themselves to capture the, the terroir or the sense of place that they're working in. Um, and that's been an exciting avenue of research that we've been doing. Um, and I will end the microbe section there. <laughs> I, I am an anthropologist bringing a humanistic perspective, which means I'm also bringing text. <laughs> um, but I need a clicker. All right, let's see if I can juggle all these things. So when, um, when Rachel Dutton, who was Ben's lab partner for the, the, the assay of microbial diversity on, on artisan cheeses that he, he just talked about, when, when Rachel first approached artisan cheese makers wanting to sample bits of their rind to put them under the microscope, she was nervous. She did so with trepidation. Her sense as a microbiologist was that us, the lay public, we're squeamish about microbes, um, even perhaps addicted to hand sanitizer. Um, so she was pleasantly surprised when I would say maybe all but one, I mean, virtually everybody, um, not agreed enthusiastically to have her sample their minds, put it under the microscope, and let them know who was out there. They shared her and Ben's curiosity for for, for who was populating and these cheeses and making the cheeses what they were. So these, these here the cheese microorganisms, far from being abject, far from being uh, the source of fear and um, uncertainty, are, are aestheticized and appreciated for their contribution to the, the diversity of flavors and textures and odors that derive from the same basic ingredients, milk, a coagulant, and salt, uh, to make the diversity of cheeses that, um, that the readers of this magazine love. Right? Um, so, uh, and cheesemakers themselves expressed an interest in learning more about this science, not only so that they might impart more control of the process, but also because it augmented their own sense of wonder at the sort of magic that happens when milk suddenly is heated and, and cultures are added and suddenly coagulate, becomes like custard. And, and certainly what happens on, on the surfaces is, as a cheese is, is uh, nurtured to develop that uh, natural rind. Um, so uh, microbiologist Lynn Margulis advocated for calling such invisible organisms sub-visible, not as we commonly say, invisible. Right? While invisibility suggests intangibility, these microorganisms are very, very present among us, um, albeit beyond the reach of our vision and appreciation and apprehension without the prosthetics of microscopes. Um, so for marvelous, these sub-visible presences among us deserve our respect 
precisely the sort of respect I think that, that we are here to, um, to give them together uh, to celebrate the contributions uh, that they make to creating the diversity of cheeses that we are also here to enjoy. Um, but, anthropologist here, if microbes make cheese, they do not do so under conditions of their own choosing, right? And this is the emphasis on what the cheese maker does to manage that microbial environment so that what is developed is not just edible, but is a recognizable cheese, right? Is the cheese that the, the cheese maker intended to, um, to develop, right, to produce. And, uh, and, and that can be a, a, it's an ongoing negotiation, shall we say. <laughs> um, so cheeses emerge from, as they, pop, as they propagate, uh, what I've talked about, or what I've played with, um, calling ecologies of production. So ecology is a word derived uh, by Ernest Haeckel in 1869 from the ancient Greek word ekos, meaning home or house. And so ecology may be viewed as the study of the home life of living organisms. Cheese, on this view, is a dwelling place for microorganisms. Tim Engold, anthropologist, um, has advanced what he calls a dwelling perspective, an understanding that in dwelling, we, and he means a very inclusive, a human this we, we give shape to our environments. The resulting landscape is, quote from Engel, constituted as an enduring record of and testimony to the lives and works of past generations who have dwelt within it, and in so doing have left there something of themselves. So Engel meditates on how humans dwell in houses, but so too do dogs, mice, termites, right? The welcomed and the uninvited cohabitants contribute to, as they dwell within, a house's evolving form, contributing to the life history of a house. So too do cheeses then have life histories of dwelling of these various organisms. Um, and of course I mean that or the microorganisms dwell within the cheese, but that formation of a cheese by organisms happens within contexts in which humans and other species are also dwelling, making a life and a living while they're making the cheese. Right? Um, so for a time, if you ordered a wheel of Vermont Shepherd directly from Nature Farm in Vermont, your cheese would arrive packed in fresh hay with a card announcing the conditions on the farm on the day your cheese was born in the vat. Um, so it was a little, a little, a postcard snapshot of, of what was happening on the farm when the cheese was born in the vat, uh, when it was coagulated and formed into wheels. It might have been a, a note about three lambs being born on a spring day or a dark thunderstorm rolling in in autumn. Um, but this birth announcement, right, which accompanied your wheel of cheese, uh, in, you know, recognized this sense of, of, um, of how the formation of the cheese unfolds through these relationships that tie the microorganisms in the, in the cheese room and in the cheese itself to the, the livestock and the climate and the weather and the visitors that were passing through. When I was on this farm, I think there, were, there was at least one batch of cheese that mentioned the visiting anthropologist who had her hands in the vat. Um, so, so all these things that, that go into making, making cheese. Um, the broader ecologies and actually architectures. Um, so I just want to walk you through a little bit um, because we were asked also to sort of speak to um, architectural concept um, uh, from Gissen on the sub-nature, right, comes from um, an intervention with an architecture to reclaim the sub-natural abject spaces in which we live, the sort of dank, corners and dusty um, bypasses and so forth that architects usually would try to work around, build around, um, circumvent, but that uh, Gissen is advocating maybe trying to uh, figure out how to accommodate in our architectural spaces, right? To some extent, we can think about the ecologies of production as maybe not a workaround, like, like industrial food making would just try to eradicate everything and start from scratch, but how do you accommodate 
the unpredictable diversity of the natural influences that are part of a landscape and part of an environment. So, so let me just walk through, in a sense, um, some of the architectural spaces that are parts of these ecologies of production. There's, of course, um, the barn and the milky parlor, where rumen animals let down their milk for human extraction. And animals um, produce, meaning release, more milk when they are calm and comfortable. And architecture and, and ambiance play a role. And I heard a lot of NPR and milking parlors <laughs> in my visits across across farmstead operations. But others I heard, you know, like jazz or anyway. But, but there's often music, right, in, in, in these milking parlors um, or NPR. <laughs> then there's the cheese house, right, where milk is curdled and curds are formed into wheels of cheese. This is often a hot and steamy space. Not least, there's the aging facility. Be it an underground cave, an actual cave, um, this, the one on this one, this is Vermont Shepherd. It was uh, fashioned from concrete culverts, repurposed, sunk into a hillside. Um, or, or an above, above ground climate control room in which humans labor alongside their collaborating microorganisms to cultivate those so-called natural rhymes, which take quite a lot of human labor actually to develop properly. The cheese cave um, is probably a, a, a really lovely example of, of Gibson's subnatural architectural spaces. Um, Artisan cheese caves are, are, are tolerant of um, some of the ambient environmental conditions. It's not hermetically sealed, um, like the very laboratory-like conditions of industrial food uh, production. Um, rather, artisans sort of try to work with, uh, to accommodate some of those natural variations, even as they also work to um, avoid contamination from unwanted species. This is uh, another uh, underground cheese cave. This is um, Orb Weaver Farm in uh, Vermont. And this is Willie Lehner's uh, cheese cave when he was still sort of in the, the I, I, this looks like Mike, Mike Feeney to me. Um, but <laughs> it's in Wisconsin. And Willie Lehner is actually third generation uh, with American cheesemaker in Wisconsin. Um, this is actually his dad who was worked in industrial factories uh, for his career. Um, and now he's uh, cave aging, you can't see the side, but it's, it's this lovely sort of monastic kind of architectural space where he's um, aging uh, really inventive and really wonderful cheeses. So while we might celebrate the mutual dwelling of human and microbe in the subnatural space of the cheese cave, it is, however, important to note, and I'm just going to go back to some some of the things that Ben was saying, that not everyone is invited or welcome to dwell there. Often it's not subnatural spaces are home to cheese mites, which can get out of control. Um, maybe the occasional fly, maybe not so occasional, um, and probably most alarming, uh, E. coli <coughs> listeria. So to dwell and to work with microbes is to make to dwell and to live with microbes to make cheese successfully means doing so selectively. Uh, so when cheesemakers care for cheeses in the aging room, they are putting selective pressure on that microbial environment by regulating humidity, by regulating temperature, by flipping the cheeses so that they have even access, the, the top and bottom have even access uh, to air, brushing down um, the development of filamentous mold, depending on you know, what style of cheese you're making. Um, this is a, a salt brine solution, so adding more salt, which again has um, uh, antimicrobial properties um, at the same time that now we know it's also smuggling in microbes of its own. Um, nobody knew that. <laughs> um, so uh, trying to, to facilitate the flourishing of the good wanted microorganisms so that they can outcompete any uh, icky ones that are around. And of course, the scary ones are pathogenic, but more often than not, the bad microbes um, are, say, bacteriophage that aren't going to harm humans if they are consumed, but they will make the cheese nasty. right? Um, so producing cheese, not, not so much that it's unedible, but that it's not so palatable. 
Um, and we are talking about a commercial product here, so that, that matters. So um, I've described artisanal cheese making as, as, post, as a post-Pasteurian practice, not an anti-Pasteurian practice. By Pasteurian, I mean it's maybe this hyper-hygienic, um, get rid of everything, we only want known controlled you know, organisms, the, the ethos of industrial food processing. Post-Pasteurianism takes after Pasteurianism by embracing hygiene, by recognizing the significance of hygiene, of hygienic practice, sanitizing and, and cleaning, um, but moving beyond the sort of hyper-hygienic impulse of Pasteurianism to, to uh, try to work with those, collaboratively with those good microorganisms, including the ambient ones that really no one had a clue who they were before Rachel and Ben started doing um, this natural history survey of our cheeses. Um, okay, so in suggesting that artisanally made cheese emerges from entire ecologies of production, I mean to call intent, attention both to the multi-species activities and agencies that contribute to the substance and to the form of a cheese, but also to how that generative ecology is made possible is organized and is constrained by broader social forces, market forces, um, as well as government regulation. Okay, so the farm is not an isolate. The cheese does not stand alone. The farm is not an isolate. It's tied to urban markets and tastes, and it is under the purview of regulatory apparatuses. The subnature of cheese is far from strictly natural, right? It is highly, highly regulated. Um, so Gissom's embrace of subnature calls for the innovative reevaluation of what architects have often identified as problems to work around, the dank basement, the weed-strewn median, whatever. Um, and in post-Pasteurian food making, artisans confront the problem of FDA officials who remain wary of subnatural food facilities and really want to see everything cleaned up much more. Um, so I, I, I just want to leave you with, um, hopefully not a pessimistic note, but a, but a realistic note, that um, raw milk cheese, the, the wood drain boards that are often used in, in the cheese, these, these sort of architectural and practical elements of, of subnatural cheese or of post-pasturian cheese making are, are under some regulatory threat. So if we are going to have a subnatural culinary future, to borrow from you know, the theme of, of this symposium, this, this set of events, if we are to have a subcultural culinary future, it's going to take political as well as artisanal work. Um, and we can talk further about that if you'd like. The first thing I'd like to do is to uh, welcome and recognize the people on my staff that are here. I'm really pleased and proud of, of the folks on my, my staff that have come. Flo, who's the co-owner of Chapel Hill Creamery, is here. And we've got Brian and Ashley and Callie who are here. And I'm just so thrilled that, um, you know, my staff's really into cheese. They do a great job. And I'm just I'm really happy that they're here. And if you want to talk cheese, any of them will be delighted to talk cheese with you. So thanks, guys, for coming. Appreciate it. And I'd also like to recognize, it's, it's just a photograph, but Jenny came a couple of weeks ago and took pictures of our cows. I'm so Beautiful. proud of our cows, too. Now, don't, not, not necessarily prouder than I am of the staff, but um, we have a great herd of uh, 30 or so Jersey cows, very healthy and hardy, and I'm just, uh, there's, there's three of them right there. I'm very pleased to to introduce those ladies to you. So, um, Americans just don't really know very much about making cheese at all. And so I'm happy that y'all are here. Thanks for coming. And by the time you leave, you're really going to know a lot more about cheese making than 99.9999% of Americans. So um, there's a lot of romance about cheese making. I was very romantic about making cheese 14 years ago when Flo and I got started and, and I'm now I haven't lost all the romance, 
but my feet are fairly grounded in reality, and I want to talk about some of the reality um, to you guys today. So first of all, um, where did cheese come from? It's a fermented food, and really it helps us preserve milk for the future. So if you've got milk, it's going to spoil if you don't do something with it. Well, if you can ferment it and get rid of some of the moisture, then you can preserve it. Heather and Ben have talked a lot about the, the microbes on the rind, but not a whole lot about the starter cultures. And I want to make sure that you all understand that there's life inside the cheese as well. So I'm going to go over how do you make cheese. So you've got milk and you either pasteurize it or you don't. And when you get it to a temperature that's suitable, you add culture. Now, if you don't overtly add culture, it's there anyway, and I'll come back to that. But at our facility, we add culture, we add starter cultures, microbes that uh, make acidity, that's part of their job. And we also add adjunct cultures, which give flavor, put gas holes in the cheese. Maybe they, uh, as Heather said, we, we seed the milk with spores of white mold. That white mold loves air. It's going to grow wherever there's air. Hence, it grows on the outside of the cheese, and you get something that's similar to a chamomile. So you've got starter cultures working in the cheese, and you may or may not have adjunct cultures doing something either in the cheese or on the surface of the cheese. The starter cultures are critical because they make acidity. They're what's responsible for the fermentation of the milk into something that will be preserved. So they're making acid and they're making flavors. Um, you add rennet. Rennet is an enzyme. It comes from the stomach of a young ruminant animal that's still drinking milk. You can, you can use rennet that's manufactured in other ways. We do for a couple of fresh cheeses, but mostly we add traditional veal rennet, calf rennet. Um, we'll probably have questions about that later, but we'll, we'll come back to that. Um, then you cut the curd, oh, excuse me, the rennet coagulates the milk into a solid, sort of like yogurt. You cut the curd into pieces, and the whey starts to leave the curd matrix. That's called cineresis. It's just a fancy word for separate, the curds are separating from the whey. Now, depending on what cheese you make, you might stir, you might heat, you might cut the curd smaller to get rid of more whey or larger to get rid of less whey. And all this time, your starter culture is working, and you're making acid, and you're making flavor. When you have... <coughs> come to the right point for whatever cheese you're making. You gather the curds and you put them in some sort of mold and then you, uh, you continue, you might press, you might tie a bag around it to press or you might just let the curds slowly drain over time. Then you have to come back and salt because salt helps to preserve as well. So uh, then you start thinking about a rind and what's gonna grow on the rind what kind of care you're going to take and what kind of temperature and conditions you're going to use for ripening. But basically, that's how you make cheese. Have I left anything out, guys? Okay. So, uh, coming back to the, the culture issue. Yes, you can buy cultures from France or Denmark or wherever. Most of ours are, are actually from Denmark. Or, when Flo and I went to Italy, we would go to all these cheesemakers and we'd say, what, what kind of culture? And they'd say, no culture, no culture. And what that means is they weren't adding any culture overtly. But there's bacteria around. Now, you can do that. To me, it's a little scary. And one of the reasons is that uh, you, you, you don't know what the ambient bacteria are. So for us, this is, where, this is where the romance leaves. We want to make a cheese that's delicious. We want to control what the flavor and texture are like. We want consistent results in that cheese. And we want the cheese to be profitable. And to do that, we're going to add culture so that we can replicate what we're doing. 
We don't have the same amount of culture every single time because the milk changes. We're a farmstead operation. Now that's another big factor. If you're, if you're in an industrialized cheese making operation, they actually, they take in the raw milk, then they take it apart and they put it back together again. If it's low, too low on protein, they're gonna add some milk powder. If it's too high on fat, they're gonna take some of the butter fat off and sell it to somebody or make something else. We don't do that. We're a farmstead operation. And so whatever comes in, that's what we use. That means as the milk changes from throughout the year, we're gonna change how we handle things. And these guys right here that make cheese, they have a very high level of skill, much more so than an industrial operation because they have to be smart and they have to think ahead and they have to figure it all out as things are changing. So um, that's one of the real differences in what we do as well. Um, I want to talk just a little bit about pasteurization. Uh, I think it needs to be said that the legal requirement is that if you're going to sell cheese at less than 60 days of age, you have to pasteurize it. That's the law. So we do that. We pasteurize any of our cheeses that we're going to sell within 60 days. If we're going to hold it for more than 60 days, then we don't pasteurize it. Um, we're, we're really careful with our milk, and uh, and I'm looking forward to, maybe you all know more than I do about this, but our milk I'm quite proud of because of the incredibly low bacteria count. Um, when I go to milk quality workshops, they say if you have more than 10,000 colony forming units per cc, your milk is not of good enough quality you need to improve. If you're below 5,000 colony forming units, per cc, then your milk is of excellent quality. And we're usually in like the 300 range, which is sort of, you know, kind of on a par with pasteurization already. Now, there's some information out there, as I understand, <coughs> that you maybe want a few more bacteria than that. And, and, and I'm just starting to hear about that, and maybe you guys know more about that than I do. Question, I, I wanna, I wanna, pose the question of where is that bacteria coming from? Now the milk from the cow's udder is supposed to be sterile. If you have a cow in absolutely perfect health, that milk is going to be sterile. Now you've got bacteria on the teat skin. No matter how well you clean it, you're going to have bacteria there. You've got bacteria in the environment. Hopefully you're not milking uh, downwind from the manure pit um, so, because those are not the bacteria that you want to have in the milk. No. Correct no. <laughs> um, where are these bacteria coming from? And if you want to have a certain amount of bacteria in the milk, how do you know they're the good ones? These are all the reasons that we use a culture. We, I call them good soldiers. The culture that we put in, that's the good soldiers. If we put in enough good soldiers, then if there are a few bad soldiers out there, they're not going to make it. The good soldiers are going to overwhelm them, and you're not going to have pathogenic uh, bacteria counts in your milk. Um, and, and so I look forward to more discussion of this during the uh, question and answer. A couple other things about food safety. The acid that your starter bacteria are making, it's incredibly important to food safety. So you want to take pH measurements all along the way to make sure that your starter culture are doing exactly what you want them to do getting you acid enough, quickly enough, so that your cheese is, is a safe product. You also want to get rid of moisture, water activity, A, little W, water activity allows microbes to grow. You want that for a while, and then you want it to slow way down. So you want to get rid of that moisture, plenty of cinerasis, and then you want salt. Got to have salt to keep the cheese preserved, so that's very important. And then uh, you look at the rinds and, and what do you want to grow on the rind and how are you going to protect it against bad bacteria. And I don't think we really, uh, I think we really need to emphasize that that's, that's pretty much the danger point for a lot of cheeses. And particularly for some of the cheeses where the rind actually raises the pH during the ripening period. If your pH of the cheese is 5.2, but whatever's on the rind is ripening, 
is, is raising that pH as it ripens, that's kind of your danger point. It doesn't matter whether the cheese is pasteurized or not. That's where your danger point is. So I, I posed some questions, I guess, and, and I look forward to hearing what you guys have to say about it. And I'm sure you folks have got some questions as well. So thank you. And Tom, thank you. Produced by Duke University, online at duke.edu.